find my spontaneous notes here. I got some very strict guidance from Mike on what to talk about, and so I wrote it down. But I do appreciate the uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's nice to hear what a fine fellow you are. I'm happy that my wife could be here and hear what a fine fellow I am. I wish my wife's mother could be here to hear what a fine fellow I am. For, for uh, the Eisenhowers, I'll say that uh, I agree with that young man, uh, what he wrote. We just were in New York just a few weeks ago, and we went to breakfast with Tom Brokaw and uh, Senator Dole. And they had a breakfast, special breakfast, and they invited several Medal of Honor recipients there. And they're going to put together with some well-heeled New Yorkers, hopefully, a suiting memorial to this great, great American, probably one of the greatest people, uh, not just America, that, that the world has ever produced. So I was very happy to be there. <clears throat> I was a little disappointed that he didn't uh, include Valley Forge in the holy places, because certainly, along with the other places that he mentioned, Valley Forge surely fits in to one of the holy places in America, along with uh, Gettysburg and the other places that he mentions. So Mike asked me to, to tell you about the origins, kind of the origins of the Medal of Honor legacy, this teacher thing. And he gave me strict guidance on how long I could talk, so this is going to be quick. When I joined the society <clears throat> many years ago, uh, there was, there was like 400 of us, and we, were, we went to cities around America to have our gatherings. And at those gatherings, we partied. And when you party with people like Scooter Burke, Pappy Boynton, Commando Kelly, Chief, these were world-class partiers. <laughs> and so when we left these gatherings, we left pretty much with a hangover. And we didn't leave very much behind us. And then one year, we went, when I was president, we had our gathering here in Philadelphia. And Mayor Rendell then, at the time, <clears throat> invited us to go on a, a drug march, whatever you call it, at midnight, through the ghettos of Philadelphia. So a bunch of Medal of Honor guys and the governor and, and other people, we went through those ghettos at that time of night where there was drug dealings and all kinds of crazy things going on. And then the next day, for the first time in my experience, we were invited into a high school. And we had to go through a metal detector to get into the high school. And so it kind of started us to think that maybe we ought to leave uh, with something other than just a hangover. We ought to leave something behind us the, the, metal, the metal is a symbol. Symbol comes from the Greek word meaning half token. When you, when you combine it with the other half token, it represents something above and beyond itself. The metal represents courage, sacrifice, and patriotism. The, the American flag. The other half token of the American flag is the Constitution, the Declaration. That's why the American flag is unique, and that's why the American flag is so important in our society and such a great teaching tool for the children. We didn't have any money in those days and every recipient did his thing in his area. They still do. Whatever the communities they're in, the Medal of Honor recipients do so much and I can tell you stories all night about what these kids do, kids, these guys do in their neighborhoods and hospitals and the schools. And then we had a guy come along to the society a guy named Wally Nunn. Wally formed the foundation. The foundation is probably the most powerful foundation in the world. And they began to provide us with funds. And those funds then allowed us to develop lesson plans and POIs to go out to the schools across America. 
And Wally has now connected us here. And what a great, uh, the Medal of Honor Grove, I remember going there and having that dedicated. That was such a precious thing to so many of the World War II recipients. And I was telling the story earlier about uh, one of those guys, his name was Voss, and he had glasses about that thick. And he was a gunner in World War II in one of those, whatever those fixed wing aircraft were. And his goal when he died, he wanted his ashes spread around the tree, his tree. In those days, we all had a tree at the grove. He wanted his ashes at his tree in that grove. And of course, Mother Veronica. And so we've evolved. And, uh, you know, they say, would we, live our, would we live our lives over, if we could, would we live our lives over again? And I think we all look at ourselves and we think, you know, I'm not the man I would have liked to be. I can't do it over again for myself, but we can do it, live our lives over again through children. And none of us, no parent is a failure if their children succeed. And so that's our goal, to pass on to these children the uh, things that we learned, not just in combat. You'll find that many Medal of Honor recipients did far more uh, in civilian life, and you go right down the list, presidents, scientists, right down the list of Medal of Honor recipients who have contributed, not only defended this country, they designed this country and did so much besides what they did in combat. And our goal is to teach these children that they can be heroes. And they don't have to go into combat to do it. Courage, not born equal, certainly in terms of, of opportunity and ability, but in the one way that it matters, we are all born equal, and that's in courage. You can have all the courage you want. You can't use it up. God has made this gift infinitely available to all of us, and it's the key to success in life. Sacrifice, which we define as love and action, I think is a source uh, it's, it's a source of the foundation of this country, of course, and I think uh, that it is also, in fact, the source of happiness in life, sacrifice, love and action. So the teachers, you know, I had a, had a boss one time say to me, <clears throat> uh, after I really screwed something up bad, he said, Pat, nobody is a total failure. They can always serve as a bad example. <laughs> so that's what we are. We're kind of like bad examples. And if you knew these society members like I do, you would know what I'm talking about. So we're kind of like that. We want these kids to not make the mistakes we did. We want them to go around it. We want to live our lives over again through them. And the teachers, you know, the teachers, after years and years of doing this thing, I try to figure out what's the most important thing for a teacher to teach. What is it? Science, engineering, accounting, what is it? The simple answer is patriotism. Democracy cannot survive unless we grow patriots. That's not someone who says they love their country. That's someone who supports and defends their country. And this was something that the ancients, I'm told, believed in a moral and civic education. During the Enlightenment period, they wiped that out. Came back Jefferson and those guys said, you gotta have morals and civics in your education. It's kind of fallen into dis disrepute in our country. Jefferson, in fact, on his tombstone, did not make note of the fact that he was president of the United States. He said he was the founder of the University of Virginia. He believed in education, moral and civic education. Grow patriots or, or be gone is what it really amounts to. And when I talk about patriots, I always uh, tell the story of Webster Anderson. He was a great black soldier in Vietnam, artillery guy, big powerful sergeant. He was on a hilltop in Vietnam one night when the communists attacked. The initial attack, they pretty much took off both his legs. It was in the middle of a thunderstorm, 
and, and the next attack, they threw a hand grenade into his position. Webster caught the hand grenade. And when he was throwing it clear of his position, it pretty much took off his arm. I flew in that night to pick up what was left of Webster and his wounded and took him to the hospital. The doctors tracked him for me. I didn't know who was in the back of my helicopter. And uh, Webster got the Medal of Honor for that action that night, and he uh, thought I saved his life. The physicians saved his life, but we became very close. And we used to go to talk to the kids. One day we're in a uh, classroom in Oklahoma. He wouldn't sit down. He had these bad prosthesis in those days, and on one arm, nothing but a cane, but he, he'd stand up, we'd prop him up, talk to the kids. And one of the kids uh, raised his hand, he says, Mr. Anderson, knowing what you know now, that it would cost you two legs and an arm, if you had it to do over again, would you? And Webster, I'm, I choke when I think of his answer to this day. He said, kid, I've only got one arm, but my country can have it any time they want. And I'm sure those children sitting there looking at this great soldier who was more plastic than he was flesh will be forever impressed with what he told them and what the true definition of patriotism is and what I believe is the most important thing that we can teach our children. And the combination, and, and, and when I think of why did we do what we did, the guys in, in, in combat and all that stuff, we did it for people like you. We did it, and they keep saying it's not because you hate the guy in front of you, it's because you love the guy behind you, but you love the guy on both sides too. But it's for people like you who will give so much to worthy causes and to keep this thing going and keep that symbol, which is all it is really, courage, sacrifice, patriotism, which are so important to this country, the future of this country, and, and teachers who will teach children to be patriots. So God bless you for what you do. Love to be with you. I'll see you in June.